so excellent. So Thank let's uh, I'll just formally introduce you. So Elvis, our guru physiologist from Nigeria, is going to do a talk tonight on a systole. So um, this is kind of our new and improved, well, summer version of these talks. Um, as some of you probably know, we're moving to fortnightly catch-ups just over the summer period, just why uh, everyone's out having holidays and enjoying the weather. So um, we'll reconvene hopefully probably after summer to maybe fortnightly uh, to weekly, but we'll see how we get on, but we'll certainly update you as time goes on. Um, but in the meantime, uh, over to you, Elvis, for your, your talk, mate. All right, thank you, Jared. Um, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Elvis Sobae. Um, currently in Nigeria, kayak physiologist. And I'll be talking tonight on um, AC study. Um, so here's my outline. And uh, this is what AC stool looks like. AC stool is actually um, referred to as a flat line representing the cessation of um, electrical and mechanical activity of the heart. A systole typically occurs as a deterioration of the um, non uh, deterioration of initial non perfusing uh, ventricular rhythms um, like uh, ventricular fibrillation, pulseless VTAC, um, pulseless um, electrical activity. Um, so, more or less like this this is what the flat line looks like. This is what flat line looks like. Uh, so, well, um, we'll get to that anyway. Let's just keep going. So, AC still represents the terminal reading of uh, cardiac arrest. Um, uh, the prognosis starts a poor prognosis. Cardiac arrest, for instance, has to do with um, readings that are not uh, uh, favorable to the heart. That um, like VTAG, VF, that do not allow the heart to contract. There is no um, a cardiac output during such uh, readings. Yeah, so, uh, um, or the, 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 yeah, so uh, it's used to represent the terminal rhythm of such episodes. Uh, you know, so it has a um, poor prognosis, about 10% survive to admission, zero to two percent to discharge. Most of most most uh, patient will come down AC still eventually um, pass on. Uh, uh, termination of resuscitation effort is considered at this point. Maybe the patient had been in beta or some form of cardiac arrest and um, kept on uh, the prognosis, kept on going bad up to the point of AC story. So at that point, um, termination of resuscitation is usually considered at that point because, yeah. So the etiology of um, AC store, AC store is uh, caused by, uh, it's it's common in cardiac arrest, so the, the, the causes are quite wide and um, could be due to the compensation for, of um, prolonged VV or defibrillation of VT or VFib and uh, any other cause that could lead to cardiac arrest, um, especially when, there's, uh, when, when the cardiac arrest is not promptly treated, it could degrade to asystole. Um, the pathophysiology of asystole is uh, it results from it, 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 the primary or the secondary. Yeah, so um, the intrinsic electrical system of the heart, if there's a failure of the intrinsic electrical system of the heart or an extra cardiac cause leading to no um, electrical activity as well as mechanical activity, uh, such a, that's, that's the pathophysiology. And then the extra cardiac um, causes have been summarized into the H and the T's. Um, so yes. primary systole of course okay. when the electrical system of the heart triscally fails to generate a ventricle. Okay. Okay. So um, so uh, the pathophysiology, the primary systole of course when the electrical system of the heart intrinsically fails to generate 
um, ventricular depolarization. De and this could be due to ischemia or degeneration of the SA node, the AV and the AV conduction system. So um, primary systole as well, it's usually preceded by bradyarrhythmias uh, due to either sinus node block or arrest or complete heart block or both. Uh, while the secondary systole occurs when factors outside the electrical conduction system of the heart results in failure to generate any electrical depolarization. And there's um, this other part of it, the reflex bradyacystole uh, can be due to either of these causes. Well, as they say, sudden, sudden death is unlikely to occur in this situation. However, the possibility exists if a systole where to persist. So a systole usually presents, um, depending on, sorry, I use the term, I use the terminology that I guess is I, I, I would have taken that out. So it depends on what, if it's um, maybe sometimes weakness, you have seen patients who uh, became bradycardic and then gradually they degraded into a systole. So, such patients might come up with lightheadedness uh, or syncope and eventually become unresponsive, maybe develop gasping or agonal breathing or no breathing at all, of course, and uh, no peripheral pulses, carotid, brachial, femoral, non peripheral pulses, palpable, no detectable heart sounds. And then on the ECG, particularly on two perpendicular leads, um, we find a flat line on the ECG screen. So it's uh, AC stool is usually evaluated on, pardon me, on um, cardiac monitoring uh, as an isoelectric flat line. There's no P wave, there's no QRS complex, there's no T wave. That's AC stool, no activity at all. The atrium is silent, the ventricle is silent. No atrial activity, no ventricular activity, no depolarization, no repolarization. So it's just an isoelectric flat line. And it's usually confirmed when the flat line reading is observed in two perpendicular ECG leads. And this is very important because um, the leads could be dis dislodged, you know, or perhaps not having good contact with, with, with the, the patient, or possible, possibly the, the connections are not very intact. And so the ECG monitor will just be showing you a flat line because it's not seeing anything. It's even possible the ECG is disconnected from the monitor. So you want to make sure of all of this to, of course, and well, patient will definitely be symptomatic, but whichever way, it's good to be sure. And this also helps to rule out VF. Um, some VF can be very, very fine. And if you don't have a, if you don't look at it well from all the leads, you might think it's just a system, whereas it's a very fine um, VF. So um, immediate investigations would be ABG, um, potassium levels, bedside echo, depending on the likely etiology. Uh, bedside, in case of suspected tamponade, you want to do bedside echo to rule out tamponade. And if there is tamponade, quickly um, do some pericardiosynthesis to take it off. That might help bring back the patient. So, and other reversible causes. So, uh, here the ACLS um, and AHA ACLS um, team has um, helped to, you know, um, make an acronym for the reversible causes, the H and the T's, and we have them there. So once we have a grip, a grab on each, if this or if, if any of this is present, you want to identify them and treat them immediately. And um, whichever way, and I'm not sure this chart is very visible, but irrespective of um, the uh, level of care, minimal compression interruption is always advised um, as against um, trying to give airway. It's better you don't even 
you're always, you know, doing the CPR, the compression, it's prioritized over uh, briefing. But if all of that can be done as um, according to the guidelines, then that will be perfect. So, um, yeah, I think this mostly just uh, an overview anyway. This is mostly for the doctors. So um, in asystole, um, asystole uh, electrical defibrillation is not advised for asystole because um, asystole is a non-shockable reading. And looking at what we've talked about, the etiology, it could be as a result of uh, degeneration of the SA node or ischemia in the SA node and um, perhaps uh, the AV node. So defibrillation may just um, rule out the possibility of recovering a reading from the heart, but most likely from the sinus or even if it's um, the, uh, maybe you know, that's ventricular, but it's it completely knocks everything out because um, those the pacemaker, the pacemaker, um, the SA node, for instance, is already defective. Then giving the defibrillation over that, it's it's completely fruitless anyway. So it's not advisable to give a shock on a system. A CPR is advised and looking look out for possible reversible causes and uh, maybe treat. If there's thrombosis, you want to approach and take the patient to the cat lab and uh, you know, get rid of the thrombus and, and restore, uh, revascularize the, the artery. And that could also help to increase the chance of uh, the patient recovering or returning to spons uh, um, spontaneous circulation. So prevention, um, is still can be prevented or be prevented by appropriate use of permanent pacemakers in patients who have high-grade AV block or sinus arrest. And then for secondary asystole, early recognition and treatment of uh, reversible causes would go a long way to prevent the occurrence of asystole. Um, pardon me, I didn't have, um, I, I, I wished I had the, uh, well, I wanted to include a case, I, but for time's sake, I couldn't, but I'll just talk over it. I remember sometime maybe 2018, I myself and Dr. Daffy, we had this elderly woman who um, was referred to him from, uh, I think, uh, somewhere in the East, and um, they, they, they managed to bring her down to, uh, well, then I was, was doing biopsy then. Um, so this elderly lady, we've gotten her into the theater and, um, you know, <laughs> it was just so favorable, God so kind. Well, just she had complete heart block and the heart rate was in the 20s or below. And um, as soon as Dr. Daphne gained access into um, the saphenous vein, the subclavian vein, pardon me, she went, she went a sister. Well, that was really very dry. I know he would recall that woman. I, I so at that point, of course, they've done the needful, but now at the point of um, implanting the permanent pacemaker, the patient went down. Then things were not as as good as they were now. We're just still starting up and building up the. Uh, the interventional services at that level. So we didn't have the luxury of um, temporary pacing then. And so we had to just go straight to permanent pacing without a backup temporary pacing. Uh, so at that point, and I know this might be helpful for some other persons who are possibly within those areas of the country where um, setting devices and equipment are yet to be made available to them. So like temporary pacing, I know Pace for Life has done a lot to um, see how to help um, um, bring in some, some uh, temporary pacemakers and the leads to help in situations like this. So, but, so what we, as soon as we did that, it was just myself himself and one of his crop, one is crop nurse. So, I went in, I started doing CPR while he was going in with the lead and, you know, got on our side, we 
got the lead into the ventricle so quickly. And as soon as we connected to the programmer, we started pacing. It was capture, um, confirmed on uh, peripheral pulses. And just like that, you know, after a while, she regained consciousness. And wow, just just <laughs> just a hell of a case, though. So uh, it's important to to uh, uh, do uh, make a referral, depending maybe for physicians, make a referral for permanent pacemaker as soon as the patient is com is in complete heart block, symptomatic, as fast as possible. Yeah. So that just needed to mention that to buttress the point here. Um, prognosis, it depends. It depends on the etiology of the asystolic rhythm, the time of the timing of intervention. Like in the woman, the case study I just mentioned, if we were not timely, she probably would have passed on. And I think the last time I spoke with him about her, he told me she was still alive. That's been some years. I think that, that should be 2018. Yes, 2018. So. It's, 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 it goes a long way, how, um, whatever the etiology, the timing of intervention, CPR, um, success or failure of advance. So all of these would determine the, the prognosis for uh, asystole. And these are uh, complications, permanent neuro neurologic impairments, uh, which usually result from uh, um, lack of perfusion and oxygenation to the brain. Oh, and the neurons generally, so they, they are very sensitive to no oxygen, to hypoxia. So, and other complications from maybe CPR or invasive procedures in attempts to reverse reversible causes, and then unfortunately that. So, um, I would just say a few more things about is still in pacemaker patients. Well, technology has gone far to help to reduce this incident, but it's good to talk about it, emphasize it, and possibly someone might benefit from it. Um, causes like um, over sensing in patients who are dependent, complete heart block patients, mostly may they are likely going to be dependent on um, their pacemaker because the ventricles will eventually be. 100% paced. So um, most of them will likely be dependent on it. So if for any reason there is over sensing, maybe noise due to noise, electromagnetic interference, or the, the lead was programmed too sensitive, which is also unlikely, programmed too sensitive, uh, it, it would over sensing generally means no pacing. Or, or under pacing rather. So the patient might not be adequately paced in at those interval. And if it's a chronic situation or a permanent situation, that patient, if dependent, may likely um, go into asystole despite having a pacemaker. So, um, and then also, uh, so in troubleshooting, if hopefully the patient has some backup reading, Troubleshooting will require um, maybe checking the, the, the polarity, the sense polarity, if it's unipolar or if it's bipolar. In unipolar leads, unipolar sense um, uh, polarity, it's usually susceptible to over sensing because it's like a far field channel interference from the myocardium and all of that. But bipolar is preferable, and current technology gives us that opportunity to to go ahead straight up to bipolar. And um, if the lead if the lead was programmed to sensitive, you can adjust the sensitivity so that it will not sense noise or um, um, some background, well, perhaps even uh, uh, myocardia um, potentials, sorry, myopotentials or whatever the source of noise might be as and think it's an electrical activity intrinsic electrical activity of the heart and withhold pacing. So um, MRI scan, yes, that is also an avenue. Uh, well, but like I mentioned, technology has really helped to reduce 
um, this occurrence in pacemaker patients. Um, MRI, most patients who would um, have an, a their device would some at some point might need an MRI to rule out something. And so even if it's not MRI compatible, they can still do the MRI depending on maybe the location, the type of machine, the type of MRI scan machine, and uh, yes, and that may help. And if it is really the risk, uh, the, the risk that weighs the, the benefit that weighs the risk for especially those who are not MRI compatible, their device not MRI compatible, but they still have to go fine, can take that. I know some centers, there are publications that um, say it doesn't really matter whether they've done for uh, MRI patient, uh, MRI and non-MRI devices and outcomes have been good. So basically what you do then is to program to asynchronous mode and um, step up the, the lower rate, the lower, yeah, the lower rate or the base rate so as to um, override whatever um, the baseline of the patient is. And that would um, for, and also the, I think, uh, yes, the, the, what's it called? The output pulse. So some devices already have that. It's just a few clicks and some adjustments and you're good to go. So um, that would help because MRI, tends to heat up the device and could cause some damage to the system or you know that could affect sensing and uh, or maybe capture so if the patient is um, dependent especially for the dependent patients they are really the the ones who are prone to or uh, susceptible to developing a system if their device develops some of these issues uh, loss of capture is also another one, and that might be due to lead dislodgement or lead displacement um, or um, insulation damage or um, lead fracture. So, um, so it's important to keep to keep um, to advise a patient for follow up, especially immediately after implant. You want to do a quick follow up and um, ensure that they are. Uh, yeah, the leads are well in position and parameters are good. Uh, another point is um, you, for noise, some patients might just need to educate them um, if maybe they, they, are, they walk or they live in areas where there's a lot of electromagnetic interference. Uh, they might just need to, or they walk into an environment and they feel symptomatic. You know, I, I just to educate them to step out from that place and that would just um, help their yeah, devices to revert to normal function. Um, so, okay, yes. Then um, battery change, device upgrade, that's another point where, although if you have um, risk of infection, uh, say increases with uh, use of temporary, but well, it depends. It depends anyway. But if you want to do a battery change, why doing a battery change as a physiologist? If you want to keep your eyes on the the ECG to ensure um, to look out for um, asystole, especially for dependent patient, whether it's CRT, whether it's CRT or um, pacemakers, you want to look out for that. So um, yes, you want to look out for that. And also, primarily, do your check before the device change to so confirm the patient has an intrinsic reading. And if not, so that would help to um, plan the, the, the strategy for adjusting, for changing the battery or upgrading the battery, whichever the case. So I think. Um, so okay, I I unfortunately I just wanted to give a picture of what over sensing. This is not complete hard block, by the way. Um, P waves are there, but just um, an idea of what over sensing would um, cause in devices. As you see, the the 
the device some sort of did not paste following uh, I don't have a pen here too, sorry. Well, you, you could see the pulses in between. The device in this case would should have paced in following the atrial depolarization, but perhaps there is some oversensing, most likely of uh, maybe uh, there's oversensing. I'm not sure, I can't really pinpoint to which um, direction now, but this shows some level of oversensing because we cannot find, it's not pacing. Whereas later you see, uh, I think there's a noise on V4, V5, V6. So it probably thought that was um, a ventricular activity and then did not, did not deliver a, a, uh, a ventricular pacing. So I just brought this up for just uh, an example. Uh, it's not a perfect example though, but just to give an idea of what of our sensing. So imagine if this patient was dependent and for some reason, the lead is sensing something else as ventricular activity, we probably would just see a flat line going all through. Um, but regard, that is not a perfect example of AC store because um, the P waves are there, but it's sort of like ventricular AC store kind of. So it's just a way of, um, we're just trying to, you know, use, uh, I, I don't know the perfect word to use, but just trying to um, borrow an idea from AC stool and interpose it into what it will look like, especially for dependent patients in complete heart block, if their ventricular leads becomes maybe, or something happens to the ventricular lead or the programming on the ventricular side is, is not proper. And what may likely occur. So I think uh, that will be all here, my references. Thank you very much. Fantastic. That's great, Ellis. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, it might just be worth, yeah, it was good, man. It might just be worth pointing out, go if you go back to that ECG. Um, I think what's actually going on there is, it's hard to tell, but because there are P waves and they're not followed by a QRS, but if you look on, if you look on V4, V5, V6, there's actually a ventricular spike there. So I think the ventricular has tried to actually pace, but it's probably loss of, maybe it could be loss of output on the ventricular yeah. lead uh, as yeah. opposed to over sensing because there's uh, if there was no pacing spike, then you could probably argue that it was over sensing. But I think given that there's a P wave followed by a pacing spike, uh, it would suggest to me that that's probably loss of capture on the ventricular channel. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. You're, you're correct. Like I, I said, it's it's not really a perfect example. I just brought it up. Yeah, no, exactly. Because of the the um, the fourth beat, the fourth beat, where it there's no patient spike in there, but there's there's an P wave. And um, nothing is going on there. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's um, and just to touch on, especially when you are doing box changes and things like that on patients with um, complete heart block. Um, as you were saying, doing a pre-op check is very important, um, especially if they're programmed in unipolar. Um, because if they're programmed unipolar, then as soon as you take that pacemaker out of the chest, then you're going to lose capture. So. It's important that you make sure every patient that you do a box change on who are dependent, just make sure that their leads are actually programmed uh, in bipolar, which is always a, a good tip. It is not too much of it. Sure. I think that's that's a really good point, um, Jared. And I think so. I, yeah, I think we got some background noise. Just one second. Yeah. Well, oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. There we go. Okay. Um, no, that's, that's a really good point, Jared. I think uh, one of the things I kind of threw this together, uh, Elvis, while you're giving your chat, I don't know if you all see my screen now. Yes, mate. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, I think one of the things to, as you pointed out with, with unipolar and box changes, is just to be aware of, of the patient's, you know, underlying condition when you're about to do a gen change. And if there are dependent that's when you, you consider using like a, a temporary pacer or setting the device 
um, asynchronous, and then also us being aware of the polarity. So as soon as that device comes out, you're going to lose capture. So you want to make sure, I, I don't know if you ever use it like soaking in a wet towel and putting in the chest technique at high output. Jared, have you ever had that? No, I've heard of that one, mate. Uh, I've heard oh, of the no. physicians talking about it or even touching right. it to like the metal instrument within the pocket, the, the can sure. itself, and you'll be able to maintain capture. But I think it's something to be, I, I don't think it's the best solution. It's always better to have a temporary pacer if you can, um, or have very quick hands, I guess, or, you know, put the device in and out of the pocket for unipolar. But unipolar can also be a good solution when you're trying to capture. So I think you gave a good anecdotal um, example, Elvis, about a patient, um, you know, being asystole on the table. We've had examples of that where the patient goes asystolic while you're trying to put in a lead, especially uh, in a patient with a, uh, with a left bundle and you accidentally knock the right bundle out. And I kind of gave this little diagram here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if the yeah. right bundle isn't functioning, or sorry, if the left bundle isn't functioning at all, and you're fishing around in there with a the lead and you hit the right bundle, you could knock out their entire ventricular conduction system, uh, which, which does happen and it's not ideal. So in cases like that, you can be ready to actually go unipolar on the lead itself uh, with one of the wires from the pocket. Uh, it's sometimes easier to be unipolar than bipolar. Uh, if you're having trouble fiddling with the, uh, getting the, the clamps on the ring electrode, just attach it to the pocket and go high output and you will capture. And that also makes it a little easier switching the lead back and forth when you're plugging into a can as well. So just considerations. Yeah, no, very good points. So you mentioned, uh, you know, for complete heart block patients, one thing you can always keep in mind too, uh, if you're doing a CRT gen change, if a patient has an LV lead, you can always pace from the LV lead as long as it has a bipolar vector set and it's not set to go to the RV lead. So that's always a consideration if you have a dependent patient is leave on high output, set the device asynchronous, and then just switch over. You'll have some competitive pacing between the new device and the old device, but you'll never lose a beat essentially. So just things to keep in mind there. You had talked about uh, loss of capture. Sorry, I'm running through this because I'm in rural Kansas and I'm gonna lose signal soon. Uh, but you had talked about all this uh, loss of capture. So I just wanted to, to show you some pictures I found on the internet. Of, of loss of capture here. So you can see, oh, this is an extra, sorry. Um, I got my, obviously I typed this up quick. This is actually ventricular over sensing. In this, uh, in this sense, you can see the device has a VS and there's no actual ventricular evoked response here or anything going on. So that indicates that uh, you are, uh, sorry, you're, you're over sensing causing inhibition. And Jared, sorry, I'll let you take point. I just kind of missed a little. Yeah, you're, we're kind of losing you a bit there, buddy. But uh, um, yeah, yeah. But um, no, that's really uh, some good points there, especially with the box change. It is just kind of, kind of preempting and things, and yeah, using that LV lead as a as a as a as almost like a temporary wire as you exchange the RV and the atrial lead over to the new system, and then make sure you're capturing from the RV lead on the new system before taking out the LV lead on the old system, and it's just playing around like with things with ideas like that is always going to be very helpful. But um, no, that was some really good tips. And and as AJ, AJ was saying, if you're putting in a CRT, CRT device or even just a, a, a normal pacemaker, then um, with a patient with left bundle, then it is important to understand that when you are fitting around in that right ventricle, that you are at risk of knocking out the right bundle. So again, just, just be aware of that and um, just be prepared. Um, again, if you're spoiled like we are uh, over here, sometimes we can obviously put some defib pads on patients as well. So, and as, despite you not being able to shock, so to speak, asystole, um, you can definitely pace through the defib pads. So, um, if your systems out there in Nigeria allow you to do that, then be sure to um, always use that as a as a bridging. I know it's not pleasant for patients, but um, it, it may be the difference between life and death sometimes. So maybe pacing through the defib pads at a slow rate just maybe enough to give them some output that they need to uh, to get them going. Maybe the asystole may resolve itself. Maybe with some drugs, it might help, but um, it's certainly, certainly something worth noting. Um, the other thing I like to do is with asystole as well is, um, is I, I see asystole as kind of this umbrella, um, but underneath there's quite, you know, there's varying reasons for this asystole. And 
So I think in terminology, it's always important that I, I personally always either describe it as P wave asystole, meaning that there are P waves present, but there's no ventricular escape rhythm. So you know that the, the, the issue is probably at the AV node um, as opposed to the sinus node. Or do you have actually sinus arrest with, uh, with ventricular standstill in that you basically do have this kind of flat line um, to where it's probably suggestive. Uh, if you're there, AJ, if you don't mind muting, please, mate, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so just describing it so that if it is sinus arrest, then you know that the issue is probably higher up and maybe the sinoatrial node is causing the issue. Um, not necessarily AV nodes. So and it's just nice to uh, have a bit of an understanding of kind of what you're going into. Because, you know, and as you said, the primary causes can sometimes be drug toxicity. Um, I've had, I've seen patients before where they're, they're businessmen and they're putting on their ties every morning and they keep collapsing. I'm wondering why. And, but they've got carotid sinus sensitivity. So it might just be their, their neck ties a little bit tight, putting pressure on the carotid sinus and uh, they keep collapsing. So just having to listen to your patient and understanding their causes, uh, their symptoms is, uh, again, a lot of these asystole events outside the hospital can be reversible, not necessarily need a pacemaker for everyone, but um, they may be reducing drugs. Uh, uh, again, you know, understanding uh, the carotid sinus massage and things like that. So that was just a couple of take-home points that, uh, that I just wanted to add to your talk there, Elvis. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, thank you. Um, really Elvis or Jared, there. there is a uh, there's something in the chat. Do one of you mind? There was, that yeah, well? yes, I just saw that. Um, so I think Elvis, it might be one for you to answer. I think it was a question about what are the limitations uh, to using temporary Sorry, I, temporary. I can hear you. I need... uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, great. Yeah, I think this was might be a question for you to answer. Um, there was a question just regarding the limitations to using routine temporary venous pacemakers in high risk patients, um, uh, especially in Nigeria. I assume it's just the availability of equipment is the biggest limiting factor. Yes, that's that's a major one. That's a major one. And um, some persons yeah. might prefer to just go straight up to a permanent pacing just to reduce the chances of infection, especially sure. when it's available. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, temporary pacing is very, yep, in, in the right center. If you're lucky enough again to have the right equipment, then it obviously you can get you out of a tricky situation. But um, uh, I, I mean, it's not very cost effective. And I, I think AJ has shown a nice demonstration here on his picture is that the picture on the right there is, is actually using a, a pace, especially if you don't think it's a permanent issue if the complete heart block might be just a transient thing maybe it's maybe they're post post surgery or something like that and they're going a bit bradycardic or whatever it may be then just putting in an actual permanent lead uh transvenously and connecting it to a box could be a way of uh getting around that as well i know again it's not a very cost effective way of doing things but again it may be the difference between uh saving the patient and not sure sure Obviously. There we go. I, I don't think it's ever a bad idea um, either to keep a extra device or so uh, just as a as a temporary pacer, right? No, not everyone has those pacer boxes and in some ways just having a uh, just a pacemaker that we have previously extracted ready to go is, is a good option. Lots of hospitals in the Northeast do that. Just keep a temporary pacer kit ready and we're happy to help furnish that, you know, a pacemaker with a Yep. Can't hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, mate. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would just say keep that in mind is just always have a uh, have an extra pacemaker ready to go. And you can just put it externally. AJ, you're, it you're not you're quite audible. Gotcha. I'll, uh, I'll post it in the chat then. Okay. Fantastic. But yeah, no, I think what AJ's saying is just having a having an old old temporary box that it may be one that you've extracted, and if you can somehow clean it up, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be sterile. You can put it in a bag or something, but just something that you can connect a lead to. That's again just going to help use it as a bridging oh, for the patient. Yes. 
you know, um, it just allows that patient to just to get that lead in and connect it to something to keep them going. Um, as opposed to feeling like you have to rush in and put a dual chamber system in. And then two days later, the patient gets their rhythm back. Um, so they are good. Like I keep saying bridging. Uh, if you think the only, if you think the heart block or whatever it is that they're having is transient, then maybe this is a technique that you could be used. Is there any questions from the group? Yeah, so can I just make some contribution? AJ and uh, Gerard and Evis, thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you. You did yes, well. sir. thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So there is um, the case that Evis referred to. Uh, yeah, we did that case 20, 2018. Uh, the patient came in with... Uh, uh, with bradycardia, the as at the time we were that time we are using a CM. I uh, think yeah, we are using a CM, and uh, there was no temporary pacemaker available at that very point. So uh, the heart rate then was between 15, 16, and we um, we said okay, let's quickly take the case. And uh, we got an access very fast. Then as we're trying to uh, take in the leads, the patient just went into flat line. So it's very common with people with um, that very low degree of uh, uh, heart blocks when the heart rate drops down to around 15 or below. So as Evie said, God was on our side and um, he started CPR, as he started the CPR quickly, I pushed the lead in and uh, we got the screw to the, to the apex and uh, the patient starts and the patient was jacked back to life. So that is another, call, another one case. Then this uh, last mission we went for in, uh, in Enugu, we had a case. Uh, this patient, that was uh, 24, no, 2013, the patient had a pacemaker 2013, and it was a single chamber pacemaker, a St. Jude single chamber pacemaker. So <clears throat> we needed to upgrade the pacemaker and also the half-life to the battery half-life has also gone that very low. So two things, we want to change it to a dual chamber pacemaker we still confirm that even though the patient has, has been on the single chamber pacemaker for that number of years, uh, the, sinus, uh, the, the sinus rate is still there, just that the patient had a complete heart block and uh, the available thing then for them was a single chamber and that has to keep the patient alive. T, when we saw that patient a few, uh, few days back. So, what are we going to do? We wanted to upgrade it to a dual chamber pacemaker. So myself, Dr. Serko, Dr. Mbadiwe, so we sat down and said, okay, what we are going to do is one, uh, we, don't use, we don't need to use so many gadgets. Uh, we are going to introduce uh, the uh, atrial leads, the right atrial leads. So that right atrial leads, the first thing we did was that um, we, we, we prepared the patient and, uh, and uh, as dissected and exposed uh, the, the battery to be changed and that battery was still pacing. Then we took an access. Uh, so when we had the access, the next thing was that we introduced the, uh, the 52 leads, uh, 52 centimeter leads. So that 52 centimeter lead, we use it for two, uh, two purposes. One, we took it down to the, uh, to the ventricle and screw it to the, um, uh, to the mid, uh, mid, uh, mid septum. And after we screw it to the mid septum, we tested the, uh, the parameters and they were all fine. So we connected that, uh, that lead to the, uh, pacing cable and we started pacing at uh, we started pacing from the programmer so when we did that the patient is already pacing from the programmer so we unscrew 
uh, the ventricular lead that was attached uh, to the old uh, to the old uh, 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 battery. So we we'll unscrew it and change it to the new battery. Connected it to the ventricular head of the new battery. Then after that, then we kept, we we decrease the pacing, uh, the lower uh, rate pacing output. On the, the the programmer is now reading sensing. In other words, uh, the the new battery that was brought in was already pacing at sixty. So we decrease the pacing output of that of the from the programmer to lower than fifty, and it's now reading sensing. So as at that point, we are very sure that this patient has we have switched the pacing from one point to the other point. So we took off the uh, the pacing from the programmer and, for, and the pacing from the new generator continue. Then we unscrewed that 52 lead from the uh, septum and pull it back into the uh, right atrium and screw it to the atrium, uh, atrium, then tested all our parameters and they were fine. Then we connected and closed back. So there was no fraction of second of his system in this patient. Uh, so you see that that techniques can help us in those of us who are pacing cardiologists in the uh, developing countries, especially if you are in an environment where you are using a CM, because a lot of um, cardiothoracic surgeon and pacing cardiology does this pacing in many hospitals with uh, a CM without the need of a cat lab. You don't need a cat lab to do a pacemaker. So these uh, tips can help in uh, minimizing the number of things that you are going to use to take one case and also take that case very perfectly without any problem. So we felt like sharing it. Then the other thing is this. The other thing that we also need to share in this uh, case is this. Um, when you are when you are also doing uh, a CROT, uh, it's also advisable. I think AJ mentioned it that you should put in your uh, right ventricular lead first. There are many reasons why you do that. One, putting that uh, that lead first uh, tells you uh, the uh, the where the tricuspid valve is. If you'll be able to figure out exactly where the tricuspid valve is, and also figure out uh, just close to the, just above close to the tricuspid valve, you have the, uh, the coronary sinus that you tend to enter. So that also gives you that this area, this is where the coronary sinus is. Then the shape of the leads entering into the ventricle also gives you an idea uh, of how you are going to look around for the coronary sinus. Then the other thing is that if that patient go into, uh, into maybe uh, ventricular uh, tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation or any fatal reading, you have a lead to be able to take over and uh, do your anti-tachycardia uh, pacing and uh, uh, take over the reading at that point. Then the other issue again is that if the patient, if the one of the indication is uh, a bradyarrhythmia and the patient go into a systole, uh, you'll be able to take over the reading immediately by having that lead there. Then another thing again is that when you are, when a patient has a complete heart block as, uh, and the heart rate is low, it's always advisable that don't push your uh, your access wires into the IVC. If you push your access wire into the IVC, when they had contract, those wires keep having contact with the lower part of the atrium. And if that happens, you can generate a reading. And if a reading is generated, yeah, the patient goes into a system immediately. So for a patient who has a complete heart block, it's always advisable that you should keep your uh, keep your your guide wires maybe at the uh, mid uh, atrium. Just keep them around there so that when you don't necessarily generate reading to knock out the uh, the fragile reading that is already existing at that point. 
So I think these are some of the things that I want us to draw home regards to ACSTO. And also, as Evie said, uh, in management of ACSTO gener generally, apart from the, uh, the T's and the H, um, your CPR is the key thing to management of ACSTO. It's a not shockable reading. CPR is the key thing. Like that case he pointed out uh, 2018, as we noticed it on the reading that this patient is on his system, immediately he went in for the CPR. So I told him, just continue your CPR and I am I will just push in the lead and get it uh, and get this patient pace. So and that was exactly what happened. We as he continued the CPR, the CPR, that fraction of second, the CPR helps in getting circulation to the brain and also the coronary uh, circulation also uh, to a segment be sustained by the CPR and also the renal circulation to the segment be sustained by the CPR while you try to sort out uh, uh, that reading and convert it to a sinus reading. And that was what we did that very day. Then uh, the other key things here is that uh, when you are also poking around uh, the coronary sinus, maybe you try to locate the coronary sinus with your uh, wires, especially people that have a, a complete heart block and they have indication for, uh, for, uh, for biventricular pacing. You, because the, the, the AV node is, very, is just sharing a border with the coronary sinus. You, you, uh, the wire may be, uh, may be touching that AV node and it may knock out your rhythm and the patient may also go into more bradycardia or enter into a system. So these are the things. Those of us who are in the uh, developing countries, uh, you must not have everything that you need to get things done. Yeah, the idea thing is that when you are a patient has a complete heart block or when a patient has any of these symptoms and you want to put a device, you want to put a pacemaker, first of all, put the patient on a temporary pacemaker. Yes, that is the idea thing. But when you are in an environment where you don't have all that, what can you still do to get a patient well satisfied and also get things running? These are some of the tips that will help you here and there. Thank you. Fantastic, Dr. Duffy. Thank you. Great insight as always. That was yeah. Um, can listen to that all day. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So Dr. Daffy, can you all hear me? My service isn't great right now. Yes, AJ, I can hear you. Perfect. So one of the things you mentioned, I, I was a really good example of how you kept the device pacing uh, by using the two leads strategy, right? You use the, the lead you'll use for the right atrium as a temporary pacing wire. That's Correct. Brilliant. And I would always, I'd always recommend, you know, having something, some way to, to keep the pacing going. Uh, things to keep in mind when you are using two different pacemakers, uh, so like an external pacemaker or the old device and the new device, if they're mm. not sent asynchronous, then they could be over sensing or they could sense a pacing spike that's not capturing and cause yes. inhibition on the other device. So one Correct. thing I always tell people is if they have like a temporary wire in, for example, and they're trying to test an atrial lead, I've seen it where the atrial output is high enough that the spike from the atrial pace was inhibiting the ventricular pacing wire. Uh, mm. Because the device doesn't know that you're pacing because they're two different independent blind devices, it'll cause mm. inhibition on the old device. So I think asynchronous, I don't, and feel free, uh, Elvis, Jared, Dr. Dafe to, to chime in here and correct me, but I think that asynchronous is your friend in those cases where, you know, you risk a little bit of competitive pacing or you risk a possible pacing in a T, uh, but for a, for a dependent patient, I think it's always better just to capture. So making sure that your device is set asynchronous, possibly both devices. Uh, so for a gen change, for example, in a dependent patient, I will have the old device set at say 80, 70, 80 beats a minute, depending what their underlying rhythm is. Um, I will have their uh, temporary wire or their uh, PSA set to 80, 90, and then I will have the new device 90, 100. The idea being that you always have the final device at the faster rate. So when you connect to it, you know you're capturing and you can turn off the old asynchronous device, but always having that uh, that backup ability and those asynchronous uh, 
devices working together. Very correct, AJ. 100% correct. Thank you. Then there are also some medications that we, uh, if you have them in your cupboard, uh, you can also try them. Uh, things like uh, isoproterilol, uh, you can try them. And then also before, like this patient that we encounter uh, at Enugu, uh, one of the things we did was that we tried to program uh, the device and brought it down to, uh, to 30, uh, 3035, and notice that the patient does not have uh, any uh, good uh, uh, native reading to mash up uh, what we have. So what we did was that we pro uh, before we started that case, AJ, we, put, we programmed, we lowered the output to uh, the lower rate at, uh, at 40. So the patient was already on the table. So we put it at 40. Then we went in and did all our changes and connections. And once the new pacemaker came in, all automatically it's, it's pro, uh, lower it at 60. So we move on and uh, find we are fantastic. But if you have all this uh, isoproterenol, you can give. And some people also suggest that, that uh, you can also lower I any. Mean, uh, raise the feet of the patient to increase uh, more output. Uh, some also suggest that you can give um, atropine to either imp uh, improve uh, native uh, reading or uh, uh, stimulate, uh, improve uh, native reading. I don't know whether they actually perfectly work, but if they work fine, if they don't work, Still follow this procedure, which uh, these processes, which we just described, and I think it will be fine. The aim is to get the patient free from any any fractions of ACS2. Okay, over to you, Jared and AJ. Sorry, I was talking to myself. There, I was on mute. Um, no, that's perfect, Doctor. Thank you so much for the input. Really, really good. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there any other uh, any other questions from anyone before we close the uh, session? Sorry to keep chiming in then, here. Then then for so our so audience, group, question, hop in. Yeah, yeah they are peanut free. Yeah, they are peanut free. We give it. You can give it uh, uh, one milligram uh, every uh, three to five minutes. Uh, during the CPR, sometime uh, while giving it, uh, it may help uh, to to, uh, to generate a reading. But the CPR is a key thing that we use in the management. That's great. Can anyone hear me right now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, mate, we've got you. We've got you later. Oh, perfect. To to your point, uh, Dr. Dafe, uh, the previous one you made about dropping down the rhythm. Um, so one thing I would always advise is, you know, reducing the rate, seeing what their underlying rhythm is. And you can do this mm -hmm. by actually bringing the rate down slowly, not just setting it, dropping it from like 70 to 30. Um, Correct. It will actually encourage intrinsic to break across as you slowly reduce the rate. Uh, if you can find a solid underlying rhythm, as Dr. Dafi was talking about, around 30 or 40, set program the device at a backup rate of 30 just in case, and that will make your changeover that much easier. Because sometimes patients will have a large pause if you immediately cut their rate off. And you don't want that pause when you're trying to concentrate, connect a new lead. It's very stressful. If you slowly bring it down, if you let the rhythm come across, then you can have a nice leisurely change over to the device, disconnect the old device, connect the new device, bring the rate up, and no one has to have any kind of, you know, clenched, uh, clenched fist moment. So it's, I would always recommend finding an underlying if they have one and allowing it to, uh, to happen if the patient tolerates it, obviously. Yes, sir. Uh, that's perfect, mate. Good, good tips. Any other questions from the group? Sounds like a silence to me. So 
in that case, we'll just uh, yeah, big a big thank you to Elvis again. Great talk, mate. Great discussions. And um, thank you very it. much, Elvis. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Jara. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Doctor. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for everyone's yes, input sir. and uh, thank enjoy the rest you. of your evening. Sure. And... Go and yeah. rest. Sleep, 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 sleep. No <laughs> work today. Sleep. <laughs> He's a lucky boy. And we'll, um, sleep, my we'll... brother, because the work was too hectic on us. Just sleep, sleep, sleep. Don't do anything now. Sleep. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Get Have a sleep, great, a very great weekend. Likewise, and we'll catch up in two weeks' time. Yes, and also we are advertising the Potaco Carnival Plus Symposium. Uh, it's, uh, the, program, the program will be out before ending of this week. So, um, AJ and uh, Jarrett, uh, there's a topic, I think, for two of you. Yes. Uh, on uh, programming and uh, uh, programming and interrogation. So, I will send it to you. Okay. Yeah. So, we are working on the final phase of it. So, I will communicate with you this week. Not a problem, AJ sir. AJ Jarrett, yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Look forward to helping yeah. you. And there will also be a, a Zoom section of it. For those of us who cannot uh, travel down to Port Harcourt, you can join from Zoom. It will be a whole day, <clears throat> a whole day program, uh, 8 a.m. to uh, 5 or 6 p.m. in the evening. Excellent, Doctor. Looking thank you, sir. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs>